wanted freedom, adjust the frames, got keys to kingdom, unlocking chains, so but a podcast, open up your brains, so but a podcast, let's get it man. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of So But A Podcast with your host Bradley Saxon. I got my friend CJ and Clifton in Yo, the house. What up? As usual. But today we got a special guest, Mr. Bill Nickus. What's up, Bill? Good morning, guys. Good to Good have morning. you in the laboratory. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh Bill, we have a tradition here at Sober the Podcast. In the beginning, we do what we call a three-pointer. Yes, sir. And so in the beginning, you get to see if you know answers to three questions that CJ's come up with. And then at the end of the show, you'll get a chance to shoot for some merchandise. Perfect. All, All right. right, CJ. All right, question number one. And we're going to start off easy like we always do. And I feel like you probably got these. So question okay. number one, who holds the most major golf tournament wins? Who and how many? Jack Nicholas, 18. All right. Bang, 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 bang. Dang. Ding, 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 ding. Is that one yeah, question or is that, that two? Was one. That, was well, one. that was one question. He gets a – he, he be bringing – you be bringing them double loaded questions. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they 50 50. All right. So, question number two What is the oldest golf course in the world? St. Andrews. Dang, ding, 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 ding. Was that in Scotland? Yep. Yes. Okay. I'm we golf. need one of them ding, ding, ding. Have you ding played buttons. at St. Andrews? I have not. It's yeah. on the bucket list for yes, sure. Uh, that'd be dope. Can man. we go with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we go <laughs> with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get in that bucket. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. No doubt. Yes, sir. All right. So, number three. From. 2000 to 2010, who is the only other golfer to hold the number one spot other than Tiger Woods? VJ Singh. Ding, 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 Dang, ding. I was Dang, even all three bro. of them. There How you about go, that, bro? Are you gonna guess? <laughs> I thought my. Got them all. I don't know. That, I was going to say that, Mickelson. Got them all, well, bro. For, for some a whole reason, decade. I was thinking Dustin Johnson. Mm, well, whole decade. But he's not old enough, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whole decade. Hold on. I got good. something. You know, I got like, something before we get started. Okay, no cramp. Don't catch no cramp. I've had this riding around in my car for a while. And Clifton celebrated 12 years of sobriety. Hey, right. and, uh, I got you a, uh, I got you a little Georgia Bulldog nice. medallion, yes, sir. bro. Oh, and I've been so wanting good, to give it bro. to you, but uh, Thank you, I man. thought today might be. This is very not, fitting. Not Dang. that the day is special. Uh, I just forgot, yeah. but sometimes <laughs> well, no. God uses that. Well, I'm about to tell you why it is. How about that? Dang. 12, 12 years, years, bro. Yeah. Hey. Awesome, bro. That's pretty cool. That is a nice medallion, bro. Mm. With them dogs colors. Them dogs. Dude, that was very <laughs> hard. Dogs. Could you put it so. towards the camera? Uh, that was that was really hard for me yeah. to buy, but uh, <laughs> for you, Clifton, anything. Yeah, well, so. Let me let me tell you about this. So last night we had a really special night at our recovery meeting. So we've for a long time we've had a bunch of girls getting years and multiple years of sobriety, and the guys we've always had a struggle with. But here recently, that's all changed. And last night we had four guys pick up year or multiples. Let's go. All right. And then we had three girls pick up year or multiples. Let's go. So we had seven people picking up, you know, years or multiples. The the Ito picked up seven years. His oh, wife wow. picked up five. Let's that's go. Amazing. All well, right. you know how it is when you give your your chip away. You know, like if you get you pick up a chip and then you give it mm -hmm. away to someone. Yep. Well, somehow or another, since I've not been coming to the the meetings, it somehow shifted to giving away a chip instead of your medallion. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I saw it happening, and then they were like grabbing the one-year chip and giving it to someone and keeping their medallion. And so I, at, at the end, I took a picture of everybody, and I said, hey, I need y'all to come together. I want to share something with you. We got to change our culture here because somewhere or another it's gotten off the rails. When you give your chip away, you give your medallion away. Mm hmm and the reason you give your medallion away is because when someone has 30, 60 days and you hand them that thing and it's got a Ooh. seven on it, mm -hmm. yeah. now they got a goal. Yep. Yeah. And that thing means more than a one-year chip, yep. that's, that blue chip. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I said, and if you need your medallion back, mm -hmm. you just go buy yourself a medallion, yeah. but you give yours that's that someone right. gives you, you away. You gave yours yep. away last night. 
I, no, not last night, but I, I gave mine away. Mm-hmm. I gave it to my son. Yeah. Give and, it away. And I didn't need to go get me one because it's okay. Yep. But God wanted me to have one. <laughs> so right after I told everybody that last night, How about that? he had you remember to give me this, and that's why you didn't give <laughs> that, it before. That's so cool. That's, that's how God great. works, man. I love it, dude. Love you know, it. Yeah. here's the cool thing. Everybody that comes on Sober to Podcast and in Recovery, uh, but the day we got a guy, yeah, yeah, Mr. Nickus, that's in recovery. Mm-hmm. Bill, how long you been sober? Uh, not just celebrated nineteen months. Nineteen this wow. months, awesome. yes. yes, sir. And awesome. you've had success in the past with recovery, but in mm-hmm. in this season of your life, God has afforded you nineteen months of continuous mm. sobriety. Yes. Yeah, wow. and it's beautiful. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, Incredible. I know it's more beautiful to you than many, but as a couple guys that get to see you grow where you came from, we just want you to know that it's a beautiful story that God mm. is writing, and uh, we are fond to have a front row seat to what yeah. he's doing in Thank your you, life. Bro. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so a lot of the way that we do testimony, and I told you this when mm-hmm. we talked, is we usually in a general way share what it was like, what happened, uh, and what it's like now. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have a choice of how you want to navigate, uh, navigate that story because some people talk about their childhood, but you've got a lot of experience just in recovery in general yeah. over the last mm-hmm. five years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> where, where, where you think, what do you want to know about Mr. Nickus? Well, you, you think we should start from the jump? Yeah. Start from I mean, did you grow up in a broken home, or did you grow up in a home with mom and dad present? Mom and dad present. I, I was very blessed. I had a wonderful family, great mom and dad that were very present in my life. Um, you know, we went to church. You know, I grew up Greek Orthodox, so I was not a fan of uh, full transparency of church. I, sure. It felt real condemning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I enjoyed youth group, and we, we did all that good stuff. And, you know, I lived a pretty normal childhood are you from here from columbia south carolina okay yeah columbia was where but I was you're not a gamecock fan you know it's yes <laughs> despite <laughs> your daughter going to I, columbia well, it, gro- i'm a it's a very weird situation yeah i am a gamecock fan but i'm one of the few people that actually pulls for clemson unless they're playing carolina and then i have to pay for is that something you know, knew yeah carolina. i didn't know that uh, yeah for some Dabo reason knows too. bro he can knows. we stop this yeah. podcast right now <laughs> <laughs> no i'm kidding yes, bill sir. i mean i would i would agree also that south carolina is probably one of the best schools Fantastic. Not just in the state, mm-hmm. but in the southeast. They mm-hmm. they produce some very fine students as far as like education. A lot of people travel to go to South Carolina, which I mean, I hope my kids never do. Yeah. <laughs> Daughter Moore School of Business. No, I'm just kidding. The if they the went, country. I'd be it's, the same way, man. Yeah. I'd be very proud yeah. that they're yes. South Carolina. I'd hopefully be a little more chore by then. Right. <laughs> what part of Columbia? Columbia. So I grew up in Forest Acres. Okay. Um I went to Richland Northeast High School. Okay, so when mm-hmm. I lived in Columbia, I lived in St. Andrew's Apartments right beside Jamil Temple. So I know. So my father, his business was St. Andrew's Pharmacy in the Boozer Shopping Center. He had that business for I thirty-five it, years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I so mean, he was probably get filled there. Yeah. yeah I was about to say, no, yeah, he probably no, filled no, some of your no, scripts. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, by this time I was sober. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. this was 2007. Was he still operating in that? No, he sold out to in the uh, early 90s. Sold okay. out to Eckerd's and then went to work for them for a little while and then retired. Oh wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Columbia, yeah. South Carolina, yeah. man. They call that the armpit of of of, of Carolina. <laughs> Gosh, it's hot. Bro, you go it through there, hot, it'd man. be 65 yeah. breeze. Yeah. You get the Columbia, it'd be 100 with no freaking breeze. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It, I, I attest to that. I yes. lived there during the summer. It very is hot. So, um, I mean, t- tell us a little bit. Like, you know, as a child or as you grew older into school and stuff like what did you love to do yeah you know growing up i played lots of sports uh you know you name it you know basketball baseball tennis really gravitated towards tennis that was kind of my sport i played competitively in tournaments and 
that that was kind of my jam. So I really enjoy that. I was big into the Boy Scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout. Really? Yeah. Didn't know. Yeah. Those are yeah. really Didn't cool know. things. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you're How a tennis knots player, can right? You tie? Yeah. Cliff? <laughs> no, I probably can't tie one of them now. <laughs> <laughs> you're a tennis player. Table tennis. <laughs> Ain't no doubt. I mean, but that's everybody knows this about Cliff. Um, did you play tennis in high school? Uh, I did. I did. Yeah. Okay. I sure did. So was drugs and alcohol a part of it your was. life at that time? I did. I, I started probably my freshman year in high school. It started, you know, as it does with a lot, smoking pot, drinking beer on the weekends. Uh, you know, and I, I managed it. I, I call it, I'm not going to call it normal because that's not normal. But for me, that was, it was a pretty, just, you know, we smoked pot on the weekends, you know, did school, did our thing. But the drinking began to escalate ju yeah. junior and senior year yeah. in high school. Did you love it? Oh, I loved it. Mm. I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, I mean, like a lot of us, you know, in recovery, I mean, I, I had that hole inside of me. You Dude, know? that's what I was just mm -hmm. about to say. Do you remember growing up, the thing that we all feel like we have mm -hmm. in common is there was just something that wasn't right. Something was off. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And that little, and I just crave that warm, fuzzy feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, But you didn't really know right. about that warm, fuzzy feeling, really, until you took that first drink. Yep. And yep. And, and then at that juncture, you say, wow. Yep. Like, we might need to do this as much as possible, yeah. right? Do, do mm -hmm. you remember when you made the move from pot and alcohol to the next? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. I was in college. I went to Francis Marion college in Florence. In, in Florence. Florence. Did you? Oh, I didn't Motown, know that baby. either. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. So I was there, um, you know, did did Greek life, frat thing, drinking, party, and doing my thing. What were you going to school for? Culinary? I believe No, believe it or not, my major was history, secondary education, and physical education. I was going to be a high school coach. Dang. Really? Yeah. He yeah. looks like a yeah. high school yeah. coach. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. You? yeah. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. looks like that guy <laughs> off All American. Yeah. That Were you gonna wear the coaching shorts? Coach, Were you gonna I don't wear know about double, all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bill has to wear them tights under the shorts. You yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, he he can't go in public yeah. out with them shorty shorts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem. Oh uh, yeah. So Francis Marion, we know mm -hmm. a little bit about Florence. Yeah, sure. So Francis Marion, my junior year. Uh, you know, we were drinking, partying. My my roommate sold pot, like a lot of pot. So you know, as they talk about marijuana as the gateway, I mean, a classic thing. That then that led to experiment with acid and ecstasy, and you know, club scene and all of that. And then my junior year, I'll never forget. I, I can remember the day like it was yesterday. I, we were, it was a Sunday evening. He had gone home to Columbia for the weekend, came back. He said, y'all y'all need to try this. And he, he whipped out some cocaine, uh, cut it on the table. I snorted one line, and I said, this is it. Fell in love. Mm. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Mm. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's sad to say I'm 40, but I can mm. tell you exactly where I was when I snorted my first line of mm. cocaine, I remember, too. Mm -hmm. too. It was yeah. that profound. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Mm. I remember, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you were you still able to manage going to class and keeping yes. your grades? At this point, I did flunk out of college. If that, yeah. <laughs> so I managed it for a while, but the yeah. partying. But you just, said you were in your junior year then. Junior year, so, so you, you know, were I went, close to finishing. I, absolutely, you yeah. know, and that you know, there, that's a, a lot of part of my story. I really really struggled early in life finishing things. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so my my senior year, I literally had fifteen hours to graduate, mm -hmm. and I dropped out of in college. college. In college. Did you yeah. deal with a lot of shame after that? I did. Because of not finishing? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, absolutely. You know, it's it's crazy when when I was, you know, just past time recently in treatment, we they, they have a thing at, at the orchard. It's called Story of Self, you know, and it's basically uh, what, what they've learned is that um, everybody in their life between like the ages of 10 or 12 had a defining moment in their life that, that affected the the way they think for the mm. future. And yeah. mine was, my dad was my idol, man. I loved my dad, but I'll never forget. I was, I was 12 years old, middle school. Uh, my sisters come home with a report card, straight A's. I've got D's and F's. And, uh, I remember dad coming home. We're sitting at the table. Uh, the girls, you know, Oh, we met eight straight A's and you know, and dad's like, well, what about you? And my mom's like, we'll talk about that later. So then after dinner, 
I remember sitting down with him. I can remember where I was. I was in the playroom, and, you know, he looked at my grades. And he didn't mean it the way he said it, but it impacted me. I mean, really, honestly, you know, for the re- it did for the rest of my life. And mm. he, what he said is if your grades don't pick up, you're going become, to become a loser. Mm. But what I heard was you are a loser. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, so that that's kind of that always kind of had that that void that feeling like i had to prove something yeah yeah you know well, and i think that's the way that the enemy before we meet jesus or 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 choreographs our flesh because a lot of times incidents sends us messages mm-hmm. and we start to define who we are mm-hmm. by like like for instance if my mom and dad like they used to fight mm-hmm. growing up well I, at 12 years old i wasn't like hey my parents need marriage counseling Mm. No, it was this conflict is telling me that it's about me and I'm the reason why they're fighting. Yeah. And here I am being shaped in this environment yep. to where I'm learning about me based on their problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, this is why in Proverbs it says, above all things, guard your heart. For out of your heart, stream the issues, the issues of life. Of life. Yeah. That word heart, and, I, you know, we, we hit this so hard in our program that word heart means subconscious mind, mm. which is where the beliefs are stored. Mm-hmm. And the enemy's job is to twist what we hear and what we see to try to get a belief in there mm-hmm. that's false, mm. which is exactly what you explained. Your dad exactly didn't right. say it, but the way you heard it, and I think in that moment there was a whisper from the enemy to get you to hear that wrong. And when you did, it was stored down in there. Now everything that comes in reflects off of that, and it's off of a false belief. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, too, man, that one of the enemy's tactics as people who have been, you know, the you know, the Bible says we get saved, God gets a new tattoo. It's like, it's like this, I got, I got this kid in my hand. But, like, this flesh is the thing that the enemy uses yeah. before Jesus to come in as a child of God to distract yeah. me from living in purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those mm-hmm. are the things that we all have had to inventory and work through and still have to keep at bay. Or it could easily get us walking an emotional life, yeah. being angry and just, you know, miserable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's profound, man. I mm. think we all probably could look back and say there's a time where I just really felt like yeah. this changed the trajectory sure. of my life, you know? Mm-hmm. I think mine came from just relationships without boundaries. Like, my parents didn't really uh, watch me. They were good about throwing me off on the weekend so they could party. And I end up in some peculiar situations at 12 dating girls. I had no business dating up on the phone with them for 48. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. you have hours talking to them. And then the next Friday at the skate ring, they don't want nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. And that seems very minute, but it destroyed me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I look at my life as someone in sobriety the first 10 years. Guess what I struggle with? That yeah. yeah, finding identity in my relationships, mm. yeah. it's crazy. Mm. So, cocaine, cocaine came straight in. You loved it. Tell us, did it did it get bad what, quick? What year was this? Just this curious. was uh, 1992. Okay, 1992. CJ, were you born? Mm. I was two. You were two. <laughs> I was. You were snoring cocaine, and I was two. Yeah. I was nine. I hadn't yet yeah. snorted cocaine. Yeah. yeah, I was real close. I was smoking heavy. <laughs> How old were you then? That was 13? when the chronic came out. Yeah. Two thousand. Yes, yeah. Oh, the chronic. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. This is when weed became real popular. Yeah. Yeah. Right One, around ninety-two. Two. Three and two. That that <laughs> yeah. chronic, not that yes. two thousand one guard. The, the real. The real the deal. deal. Yeah. Yeah. So ninety-two, and you're snorting cocaine and snorting college. cocaine. Yeah, you know, what, <laughs> what, what I realized was I, that the way I use, I'm a Avenger. So I would, we would, even even back then, you know, go on a two, three-day run, and then I, I would take a break, take a week or two off. do, And that became a cycle in my life, even to this pastime of how I've always used. Uh, I've been fortunate that I, I would stop for a little bit of time to gather myself, to mm-hmm. you know, feel like crap about myself, and then you know, as the more I felt like crap, then I'd go right back to yeah, that sure. again. Those bingers are so hard to help. Mm-hmm. Really hard. Yeah. My mo- my mother was. Yeah. And like I wasn't. Like I'm doing it. 
I'm going homeless doing it. Yeah. Like every day. Yeah, stopping. Yeah. But you know, my mother was completely different to me. She'd go six months out drinking. But yeah. when she drank, she did more damage than I did in a whole year yeah. using every day. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so I sort of relate to that because I grew up watching that myself. Yeah. I so, want to touch on that though, man, because there's different kinds of users and drinkers. And, you know, I don't think we talk about it a whole lot because we just talk about addiction and alcoholism, but there are different kinds of, uh, I guess different temperaments of people, and you say you're a, you say you were a bit you are or were a binge user, um, and I was I think probably more like B, where it's just like we we running this thing all the way out every day all day, <laughs> like there are no breaks. I didn't know what a break was for ten years. What what was that like for you, Cliff? Like what was? Yeah, no, I started I started at seventeen and didn't stop till I was thirty three. Mm-hmm. Did just did nonstop, you know. Did, unless I was in jail or something like that. Right, unless yeah. something outside of you stopped. You, did you feel like you had the uh, propensity to stop, and so that gave you some type of false idea? Like, because we always of talk power. about... The, so we always talk about willpower is practically non-existent, mm-hmm. right? So, like, if you have the ability to stop and not, you know, use for a week or, you know, 10 days, did that create some type of false idea where, Absolutely. you know... Absolutely. Well, Let maybe I'm really not an again. addict. Well, yeah. Again and again and yeah. again. You know, well, I stopped drinking for two weeks. I'm, I'm not oh, an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah. I can have a few beers. Yeah. Which I love mm-hmm. because here is the ignorance towards alcoholism is that people consider alcoholics or cocaine addicts people who booger up West Whitner Street. Yeah. Yep. That have just lost their mind, never coming back to mm-hmm. under a bridge, yep. carrying a, a a a bag. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But like, it could be so. It could be that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's so much more than that because what Bill is telling us that the big book proves to be true is that alcoholism is is con, uh, is uh, summed up in two words: if, when drinking, can you control the amount you take? Yep. I mean, have yeah. I ever smoked crack and controlled the amount I smoked? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Have you, Not Bill? Me, no. Have you? Never. Mm. Well, here is the deal that's, that helps people like us that have different experiences with drugs to, to concede their inner yep. self that we're drug addict and alcoholic mm. is when I quit, can I stay stopped all together? That's the deal. For exactly. the rest of that's my life. Exactly. If I say, no, I'm not going to do it, can I go the rest of my life and never pick mm-hmm. it up? And I don't think that's any of our stories. No. Yeah, so if you can't control how much you take, and you can't stop and stay stopped. That's you might be an alcoholic yep. and drug addict. Yep. yep. And they say might just to be nice. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's exactly yeah. like we don't want to rough enough feathers. So you might be. Yeah. You diagnose yourself. You tell us. <laughs> you tell us. So when did you realize that it was it it was a problem? Yeah. So as you know. My late wife, Sabre, and I, we, you know, I would go through these recreational times. We, we met in culinary school, you know, after, after I finished Francis Mary and I went and worked in the restaurant business, went to culinary school in Charleston. I met my wife there. She was from Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, was she a Seminole? She was a Seminole, mm-hmm. Florida State graduate. Yeah. How about that, Yeah. Man. So mm-hmm. I met her there, and, you know, we would party. She was one of those that could take it or leave it. You know, it was whatever she would sometimes hate partake those? with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. don't you hate those? Just go yeah. to bed, Bill. I'm yeah. the crack man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you can smoke a joint stop. I'm yeah, the they crack They wake man. up and you're like, I'm yeah. still yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Y'all been to sleep? Yeah. 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 So, it, you know, when it really progressed for me as we, we, we finished culinary school, we got married, uh, and then we moved to Anderson to, to open, open our restaurant, and then I started making a lot of money. And then I found a waiter that worked for me that could get me some blow. But then I wasn't buying a gram or two, you know. I'm buying a quarter ounce, or I'm, mm-hmm. you know, and we're, and we're getting it, you know. And it's, again, binge. Stay up all night. I might start on, a, you know, after work on a Friday and just use it, use through, get through work Saturday, keep using Saturday night, and maybe stop about 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Mm-hmm. But there's yeah. no crack cocaine in this story right now. Not, not at this point, no. Just cocaine? I, just cocaine. I had sp- experience in culinary school. I tried crack cocaine for the first time with a guy from New Orleans. I shared some blood with him. He's like, well, tonight's my treat. Went next thing I know, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're in downtown Charleston yeah. in the hood. What a friend. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Uh, thanks, treat. thanks yeah. buddy. Yeah. Scored, a, scored a pipe, you know, smoked it. I remember, I, I mean, I threw my guts up, mm-hmm. you know, and threw up. But then I'm like, 
I'll take another hit. Yeah. Did you get the whoa, 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 I did. Whoa, 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 it was whoa. really weird. I, you know, quite honestly, I, I don't know if I really liked it that time. Mm. But I, but I liked what it did. It gave me that pound. Oh, uh, there's heart, no doubt. You know, I love that. Uh, but then, you know, I kind of went away from that. But what it did is it planted a seed to where I knew I could go score. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because that's what ended up happening. So once I started using these binges, became more frequent. Um, first intervention happened uh, with her parents and my parents. I had no desire to stop, but I wanted to rehab. I, by the way, I could write like a trip advisor on rehabs. I've been to yeah. so many rehabs. Well, well, give me a year. Give me a time frame of this. Okay, the, this, first the, time. The, the first time this is in uh, 2000. Okay. Okay. How old are you at that 2000. point? 2000. I am... Uh, 24 years yeah, younger I'm, than I'm, he is now. Yeah, I'm like late, <laughs> almost 30 at that point. Okay. Yeah. No rehab until 30. No rehab till 30. Okay. So, you know, I'm close to you that Cliff. Uh, my first time of sobriety was 34. So... So that, and that's when I, I got sober in 2004 the first time. But I, so it was rehab, had no desire, you know, got out of rehab. I probably stayed, you know, I wasn't going to meetings, doing anything, a few months, just dry. So you're going I, to rehab for other people. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Had no desire. I was, it was like, okay, I understand the cocaine's the problem, but I'm not, you know, we've got a huge wine list. I'm not stopping drinking wine. Yeah. That's part of, you know, what do I do for yeah. a living? And yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So of course, what did it do? it do? Led me right back to to my drug of choice. So what ended up happening? So then went rehab again for the second time. Vanished. Went to Atlanta. Went off the grid. This was kind of when cell phones were, you know, flip phones and stuff. It yeah. was. I mean, they thought. I mean, they had a police looking for me. They thought I was dead. And I, hmm. you know, and I ended up, you know, finding blow down there. Did my thing. And then the the second time, I really knew that. You know, this is not right. I've got a problem here. Mm. So went to rehab again, um, then came out, and then that's when I was I was trying. I really was trying at that point, but couldn't seem to grasp mm-hmm. it. Go to me and go thirty days, slip, go back, pick up another white chip, and you know I did that. Ended up again going on another, and then I was one of those people. Well, you know, that's where that I'm a loser thing came. Eventually, I can't do this. I guess this yeah. is just my destiny. Mm. So then I go on a bender again. Mm. And then, and then the cycle eventually, where you know, Saber had had enough. I mean, she had to, at this point filed divorce papers. She's like, "I'm done. I'm mm. done." So, it was uh, late 2003. I had been on the the longest, and at this point, but I'm just let me preface this. So, what happened was. She, you know, we, we live in a small town here, you know, and she pretty much told anybody, like, if anybody sells Bill Blow, I mean, you're fired. This is it. Like, it's done. So, Blow went dry, mm-hmm. completely dry. So, mm, seed planted. Yeah. Went right down the road, three minutes from the restaurant, five at the most. Mm-hmm. Boom. Knew how to do, knew, knew the, the jargon, the lingo, scored me some rock. Mm-hmm. And then off I went. And that December, I, uh, I went on a crack cocaine binge. I mean, I spent almost fifteen thousand mm. dollars smoking crack mm. cocaine in thirty days. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, just insanity. I mean, just you know, she had kicked me out of the house. I was living over there at these uh, a furnished apartment, uh, and I, you know, I got to the point where I was just, you know, at a dead end road. Re- at this point, my parents wanted me to go to another rehab. I went home, kind of cleaned myself up in Columbia with my mom and dad couple weeks started going to meetings there then I came back you know and what's really cool is at this point you know our you know church I attend now New Spring Church I was invited over and over and over to go to you know to come to church and you know I'm like man whatever I kind of said I washed my hands at church when when I you know left to go to college Mm -hmm. and January 2004 New Spring was at New Spring College um was that AU? AU. Yeah. 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 AU now, excuse me. Uh, went one Sunday, loved it. I was like, man, this is really cool. Different music, progressive music. This is cool. Week number two, I'll never forget, I was in the back side of, of the auditorium, left hand side. An invitation was given. Heart was pounding out of my chest. Did not stand up, you know, the, the first invite. And then said, I know there's some other people that really need to stand. And I, just something, it was like, it wasn't me. All mm. I know is I just, it was, I. the only way I can explain it is, is I felt like I had to, like the trust fall, but like off a cliff. Mm. Like, okay, here we go. But, the, you know, boom, I accepted Jesus. 
uh, I remember at this point my wife was not going to, I mean, she had had enough. I'd come back and we were staying in separate rooms, but we had, you know, had young children at this point. So I sat in my car after, I mean, just crying like a baby, man. Something, you know, I was like, something's mm. hap happened to me. Amen. And uh, that, that was January 2004, and that began my first run of sobriety, which, which lasted 15 years and nine months. Mm. Oh, wow. A long time. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. After Jesus. After Jesus. Mm. Radical encounter with Jesus, and, and, and a miracle happened inside of me. Now, Amen. those 15 years, you did go to AA, didn't you? I did. I did. I was very involved with AA. I would say especially the first five or six years. Then I kind of progressed. I was still helping people in recovery, but it was more recovery in the church. And I, I served on the care team. Sure. I would love on guys. I would meet with people kind of one-on-one -on -one about recovery and share my story and, you know, and kind of went down the road of Bible study, which hindsight, when we get to that, I, I kind of regret that I, I'm, you know, because it, it came back to haunt me later in life mm -hmm. because I kind of mm. alienated and then, your friend circle changes and all of a sudden you don't have many friends in recovery anymore. And, mm -hmm. and you know, then that it's a, people don't, I mean, you can manipulate, but yeah. it's okay. You can just have a beer. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, because the majority of them can. Right. Yeah, it's true. Right. You know, and it's yeah. like, they don't really, uh, I mean, they, they don't understand mm -hmm. alcoholism. So it's yeah. like, dude, they have no trouble with you drinking a beer mm -hmm. until you steal their car yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that night and they're wondering where you're at. Oh, he must have just needed to yeah. borrow it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? To go get some crap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've done that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, obviously, 15 years, nine months, fantastic accomplishment. You know, God's good. But tell us. I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. too, how mm -hmm. did the relationship get restored with your wife and your family over this next 15 years? It did. Years. So I, you know, I went to church, you know, when I accepted Christ, so that, that was January 2004. I went to church by myself every single Sunday for one year before she would even trust, even let me take the mm, kids. Wow, nice. So I, I would say 10 months into that, I could find, I finally got where I could sleep, we could sleep in the same room. Mm. And then, and it, that that January of the following year, and you, that was her New Year's resolution. I'm gonna start going to church with you, you and the kids. And then she went, and just in two months later, she accepted Christ. Wow. And Amen. you know, the rest is history. I'm, you know, I had the opportunity to lead my daughter to Christ years later. Mm. Love that. Mm. And yeah, well, I think so good. I think the principle here too, Cliff, is trust is earned in drops, mm. but it's lost in gallons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you ever think that Saber did not love you? Now, I'm not saying yeah. you didn't think that, but did she, in reality, ever not love you? No, absolutely so not. So we can truly love somebody, mm -hmm. but we have to know our emotional help is dependent upon who we put our hearts hand, our, our heart in their hands. Yep. And that you have to set boundaries to determine For trust. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you can't continue to put your heart in the hand of somebody that don't have the character to sustain it. Yep. And good for her yeah. 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 Absolutely. For, for sure. setting that boundary for a year for you to gain that trust. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm There's thankful for it. There's so yeah. many addicts that get so distraught when they're sober 90 days and Ma Dukes won't let them in the house yeah. or yeah. won't give them a house key or, you know, my baby mama won't let me see my kids. Well, like, bro, Look I'm glad you've made yeah. a good beginning. Yeah. yeah. But, bro, there's a long reconstruction ahead. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you know, I've always learned that when you want acceptance, you don't get it. Mm. But mm. the moment you don't need it, yep. because you got into Starts recovery, yep. mm. that's the first thing that comes. Mm. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, truthfully, your relationship with Jesus and recovery is eventually over time what helped restore and reconcile the relationship you have with your wife and your kids. 100%. I mean, you know, we lived a great, healthy life in church. We ended up doing marriage counseling for lots of couples that specifically that were, were struggling with addiction. And she was very involved with that for me. But Bradley, you're exactly right. I, I mean, I'm so thankful. I, I don't think if, if she didn't make me have that time, I, I don't think I would have probably stayed sober mm. at that point. Yeah. You know, I, I needed that. Yeah. You know, and this is one of the things that we talk about is, you know, people who recover – you know, recovery is not for people who need it. It's for people that want it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like you said at first, 
you went to rehab, but you didn't want it, mm-hmm. so it didn't work. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I tell family members, wives, you know, parents, whatever, you can't necessarily make them, you can't do anything to make them want to get sober mm-hmm. today. But what you can do is you can start removing things mm-hmm. that will make their life so uncomfortable and miserable that they will want to change their yep. life. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And then they start wanting recovery. So it's like it's the removal of the comfort of mm-hmm. being in the bed with my wife. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's the removal of the comfort of being able to take my kids anywhere I want. Mm-hmm. It's like when they start removing these things, then my life gets worse. And now I start thinking, man, this sucks. Mm. I want to change. Maybe I do want something different. And then they begin to want recovery, which yep. is exactly what you're explaining happened with you. Mm. You're exactly right. I mean, she went into the point of, when she would go out with friends, she would get a babysitter. She wouldn't even when I was home. Yeah, like that. That that's how mm, serious she yeah. was about mm, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was humiliating, but I needed that. Yeah, and it got yeah. you in a position where mm-hmm. you wanted something different. Yep. Yeah. So, mm. I mean, I think there's probably hundreds of stories he could tell us about the 15 months and yeah. nine months, right? Yeah. Well, I want to hear mm-hmm. one other thing real mm-hmm. quick. Um, so. You said you stayed connected to AA after that first initial encounter with Jesus. Mm -hmm. What was that time like of where, you know, you had the encounter with Jesus, but you knew AA was important to your recovery. How long did you stay connected to AA, and what was that time like? Yeah, it was, I want to say, I mean, because it was so long, between five and six years. So it was was quite a bit of time. So you had a sponsor. I had a sponsor. I sponsored guys, um, and I loved it, you know, and it was one of those things that's, you know, it's just like anything. It was, you know, three meetings a week became two, and then kids are starting baseball and this and dance, and then it was one meeting, and then it was, oh, I'm sliding in a meeting every couple weeks, and it it, it just was that it was it was never intentional. It yeah. just slowly drifted. It, it didn't become a pro- priority in yeah. my mm-hmm. life and, where it should have been. And then church began to kind of take place Correct. of that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, and this is one of the problems that we see in, I mean, just in the Christian community is there's not really a lot of true discipleship. Mm -hmm. Whereas with recovery, it's required. Yeah, Yeah. right. And AA models it perfectly of how to do discipleship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just from hearing the story, it sounds like the discipleship that you needed, there was not that in the church necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Bible studies are good, and like all these things are good, but there was a there was a failure somewhere in there that the the discipleship that you needed didn't carry over into Christianity. Yep, is what it sounds like. Yeah, I'm no, not saying that's what on. it is, but mm-hmm. well, I mean, mm-hmm. we don't do what we do without AA. Yeah, right. I mean, that's just the truth of our story, yeah. mm-hmm. and it may it may not be the truth of the listener. It may not be the truth of some people that hear. Or, or that are under the sound of our voice, but I learned how to help people through AA. Yeah, you know, and it's because they had a plan of action, mm-hmm. and that's what we're saying, man. Yes. Is that discipleship ain't a Christian event? Yeah, right. We have a lot of Christian events: New Spring Recovery, mm-hmm. Monday Night Raw, uh, the River. But like discipleship is intentional relationships yes. you make with people, yeah. and 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 also. It brings them to results in their life yeah. dependent up like I've never really understood how you want to talk <clears throat> about God, go to church, but you have no results that God can solve problems. Yeah. Like that don't make yeah. sense to me. And the thing about discipleship is it's hard. Yeah. It's messy. Mm. It's not, you know, nice, clean, neat in a box as far as, okay, we're gonna do ministry from ten AM. To twelve thirty. Yeah, it's not you know, no cookie then, cutter. And then yeah. we're going to go to lunch, right. and then we're going to discuss things throughout the week of how to have the service. Discipleship is when I have to take my kid to practice, and my phone is blowing up, and I have to answer this, and my kid's in the car, yep. and things are moving and going, and I have to choose, am I going to disciple this man right now who's in crisis Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while I'm living my life, Mm -hmm. or am I going to choose to say no to this guy that I'm discipling? It's 3 a.m. when they're calling. Yeah, It's 11.30 when they just got put out of the house. And my wife's like, why are you on the phone? It's like, it's messy. Yeah. And it takes a lot from you. Mm -hmm. But that's really what discipleship is. It's going and having breakfast with someone and like sitting down and talking Mm -hmm. to them. 
and teaching them how to be a husband, yeah, yeah. how to be a father, mm. how to be a business owner mm -hmm. as a Christian. Mm. Like this is what discipleship is. And you know the thing, like you said about AA, you know nobody goes to college. You didn't go to Francis Marion and then you know decide you're not going to add and subtract anymore, mm -hmm. right? You know, in mm -hmm. order to do the co collegiate level math. You had to go to elementary school. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we're saying is like we went through AA, we learned the basic principles, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, yep. and then we move on into Christianity and we don't just all of a sudden say, oh, I'm gonna forget all that now. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation, mm. you know, that we learned of how to help people. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a that was a tactic when God elevated my life in the ministry. The law was is everything I've been through and learned up to then was not worth bringing into this season. Mm. Yeah. And I realized real quick when I found myself over the hills in church doing a lot of this, even even he reminded me, I started working with CJ. It took me nine months to introduce him to the big book. Yeah. That would have never happened previously before that. Yeah. He'd have been reading the book the day I met him. And I realized like my success with people is when I outline a program of action and let them know how to practically seek God and let him change their life. That's mm -hmm. it. And that's when he started getting changed. He started changing people. They started. And I just realized, man, like God wants to take the two and just utilize them. Yeah. Well, what happened is AA took the principles from Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Absolutely. from the Bible. Yep. Right. Exactly. It's from the Oxford group. It's practical yep. daily Christian living. Mm -hmm that they took the religiosity and the Christianese out of it, put it in plain man's language, and then, you know, we stumble upon it, and we start thinking of something different. No, it ain't. It's the yeah. same. It's the same yep. thing. Mm -hmm. It's just the practical walk. Mm. So lead us up to this relapse. Okay. You sober 15 years, nine Fif months. Lead 15. us up yep. to the days of yeah. your relapse. Okay, so, to you know, after quite a bit of sobriety, for the first occurrence, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2009. Uh, went through that process, chemo, mastectomy, uh, radiation. Uh, by the grace of God, she went into remission. Mm. Okay, so we, we you know, I, I tell a lot of people, but really from 2010 after, you know, she was done with chemo to 2008, I mean, we lived a fairy tale life. Mm. I mean, just a, a life that just family and each other and love and just it, it was wonderful and then uh, again it was one of those you know those those moments in your life but I'll never forget we were in March of 2018 we're at New Spring Church we, we went to a uh, a meeting for you know people that are involved in the church it was a big meeting we had a lot of stuff going on in the church at the time and we came out to the parking lot and she told me I felt you know back then they wouldn't take both breasts you know, so they only took one. So, and she told me, I, I feel, you know, a pretty big lump in my other breast. I have a doctor's appointment in the morning. Mm. And my heart dropped. Mm, I bet. And uh, so we were fortunate. We knew the physician got in quickly. I mean, by the end of that day, I mean, they had already biopsied and we had results. We knew that, you know, it, she had breast cancer again. Then PET scan happened and we knew it was on her chest wall and her lymph nodes mm. were not good. You know, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, and, and this is really kind of a weird, I, uh, you know, which since the Lord, I've been very convicted of this because it was honestly, it was self-righteousness, but I'm like, I was, I became so mad with God. Mm. I'm like, you know, God, I'm, I'm, I'm tithing. I'm, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm serving at the church and I'm loving my family. I'm, you know, I'm sober. And, all the you things know, you were told you were supposed to do. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then, yeah. You know, th then I got a diagnosis. Then we ended up going to a specialist in, in Emory down in Atlanta. And she was the only, you know, because we were so close with our oncologist here. And she just looked at her. She's like, you're, you're going to die from this. I mean, you need to Dang. understand this. Like, mm. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And, you know, I'm going to tell you, probably going to have about, you've got about a year left. Mm. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I can remember going to, to the lead team at church and them praying over us. But then just... I, I couldn't even receive the prayer. I was just so angry. Mm. And and this this anger it, it built and you know, and just this this weight of responsibility. How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna run my business? How am I gonna raise these kids? You know, I'm one man and it it just it was like this that water dripping on your head, just mm. tip, tip, tip. Mm. And uh, you know, fast forward it, it spread to her bones 
then, you know, we, we'd had surgeries, we did radiation, and then ultimately it spread to her brain. Mm. Um, so we were fortunate. We, we did have one really beautiful moment in that, at that diagnosis. It was really a miracle from God. But our whole family went to Greece for two weeks. Mm. Uh, that, that, that in, the, in, the summer, in, the, in the summer of 2019, she was, mm. you know, diagnosed in 18, summer of 2000. So she, she was fighting like heck, okay? So we, we had a beautiful moment. We get back from that in September, like the bottom dropped out. You know, her heart, she, she began to, from all the chemo she had done, it, it kind of almost turned into congestive heart failure. Heart was, so we had hospital mm. stays to try to get that and get, so, and it began, I just continued to get angrier and angrier with God. And I'm like, you know, what the heck, you know? Mm. Um, and so she, she passed uh, November 14th, 2019. Uh, sorry. It, thank you. Thank yeah, you. So thank sorry. you. Yeah, it, it was a tough time, man. Um, you know, it's been four and a half years and I'm finally starting to heal from mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but I, as you know, I, I, f I had so much responsibility. The thought of using a drink at that point was not an option. Like we got to yeah. get this business. We got to get this. I got to get these kids. I got to figure out life. You know, we, mm -hmm. we kind of, what I call traditional marriage, you she, you know, went to the grocery store and and did the laundry and shopped and at home and she all took of a sudden, care of the home. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I'm not. I don't even know how to use the high tech washer. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? How do I even use this thing? Yeah. You know. So I was learning and I was just and this and then ain't you know just this anger kept building and building and I was going through the motions. I'm journaling. I'm having my quiet time. I'm crying out to God. You know, it wasn't like I. Did you have a sponsor during this time or a mentor? So, and that, that's the issue. I had a lot of godly friends, but no one at that point that at that moment. Bradley and I knew each other, but not we weren't real close at that point. Not that person that can plow in there. Correct. Like a sponsor would. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So we get into the first of the year, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm sitting there. It's kind of quiet. Our restaurant business is quiet time. We're watching, doing the Netflix thing. And then the, the thought of starting to drink again started popping in my head. Mm -hmm. And not just every once in a while. I, I began to take that thought and really go down the road with it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know Bradley remembers this story. Late, late January that year, Bradley called me on the phone. I was leaving Greenville. He's like, bro, I know we don't know each other that great, but you're going to think I'm crazy. Um, but I had a dream, man, that you're going to relapse. Mm -hmm. And at that point... Mm -hmm. I we, I had I'd gone with my food group. I was going to Cabo, and I'd already made my mind up. I was drinking in Cabo. I mean, oh. I'd made my. I was like, "Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good." Had another friend, a friend of mine, Greg Wilson, called me. Same thing. Had this dream. I was drowning, and I relapsed. Mm. And uh, I just, you know, kind of pushed him off because at that point, I'd already relapsed. Yeah. Yes. I mean, in my mind, I had already mm -hmm. the decision mm -hmm. was made, and no one was telling me otherwise. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So if I could just mm -hmm. jump in right here real quick. So for the people that don't understand recovery, what actually happens is when the alcohol and drugs are removed, those are the, our solution to our problems. The alcohol and the drugs are our solution to our emotional problems. When those are removed, character defects come back, blaring. Mm -hmm. And so he had gotten sober. He had you know, had a relationship with the Lord. He had worked through things. But then this crisis comes, this traumatic incident comes, and he's suffering with anger. Anger is a character defect. Mm -hmm. Anger is what he's processing his emotions with. Yeah. He's hurt. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And he's hurt, and so the anger is there to help him with the hurt. He does not work through that character defect. And because he doesn't work through the character defect, what happens is thoughts of using return. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. the thoughts of using return, he's still in a place that he can be helped if he's willing to talk. Mm -hmm. about the thoughts of using. Mm -hmm. When the thoughts of using come back, that's what we call the alarm system going off. The alarm system system is going off. What is going to come after that if he does not get help is the obsession to use mm -hmm. will return. Yeah. When the obsession returns, you're done. Yep. That's a wrap. And that's what you just explained. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Cliff, and you're exactly right. <clears throat> and if I would have had my sober community, I could have gone to a meeting and shared that and mm -hmm. and and gotten over that hump mm. but i didn't my pride wouldn't allow me to do that to yeah. reach out and yeah. you know because i'm bill i hope everybody mm -hmm. i can't mm -hmm. do that blah yeah. blah what will they think of me that mm -hmm. i'm having thoughts mm -hmm. like that yeah. and, and that's why it's so important to have that sponsor or that spiritual mentor who knows us 
who is a little further down the path from us that can plow into our life and say, hey, bud, you're not okay right now. Mm-hmm. You need to do this, this, and this, or mm-hmm. else. And yeah. we have to yield to that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. important to have those mm-hmm. men in our lives, no yeah, matter absolutely. where we are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you said you made your mind up. You're made drinking mind- in Cabo. Yeah. So I got there, didn't drink on the plane. I got there. I went by myself, you know, with it was a group with a food group. So it was a bunch of restaurant tours and uh, got there. I remember getting in my room and it was an all inclusive resort and there was a little fridge in there with Corona's and there was a golf course right out, right out there. So I mean, we'd gotten there late in the afternoon. So I grabbed a Corona and I knew it was just so wrong. I knew mm-hmm. what I was doing was so wrong. I felt this sick, sick feeling mm-hmm. inside of me. And that I, was I, your spirit speaking yeah, mm-hmm. to you. Absolutely. I yeah. opened that bottle and didn't have a sip. Walked all the way down out to the, mm. to the, to, there was just a green right there was the end. Of it, so no one was playing. So I started chipping and then I chipped and then I finally went over and I had a sip mm. and, you know, and it, it kind of started slowly. So I had a couple beers that night, maybe caught a buzz, but then by the third day, I'm, Hammer drunk going into town and scored blood mm. in by, Cabo. By day, in Cabo. And you've been Score sober blood. for 15 and yeah. a half years. And you're three. in a whole other country. Yes, bro. <laughs> like, score day dope. three. Yeah. Yeah. Blood. Yeah. Can score I tell blood. you, that's called the allergy of the body. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. And for you know sure. what? Happened? Then I had to make up some BS lie because uh, I couldn't get on the flight. I was so hungover. Wow. And I was still, I mean, I'd been up using, I mean, I just ran out like we're supposed to leave at 7 45 in the morning. I'm Snort my last line at 7 a.m. Made up this lie that I'd had the Montezuma's revenge because we're in Mexico. So they pushed my flight back a day so I could sleep all day. Was mm-hmm. the blow you know, better down there? <laughs> you know, honestly, yeah, honestly, you know, it was one of those things. I mean, it was good, but I was so drunk. Yeah, I got you know it. what yeah. I mean with it. It, it just was, helped to drink. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, you ain't drinking 15 <laughs> years and nine yeah. months. Yeah, you better right. be drunk, cuz. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. just crazy. Like he talks about. You know, the allergy is kicked in. The phenomenon of craving mm-hmm. kicks in. The alcohol ain't enough. Yep. Well, here's mm-hmm. the greatest lie Bill could ever believe, is I can drink and not smoke crack. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. He has proved yes. over and over mm-hmm. again that he drinks to get cocaine. Yep. yep. Well, you know, it's like I tell, tell people, is if my drug of choice is cocaine, and in my mind where I'm completely drug-free, alcohol-free, if I can't say no to alcohol, mm-hmm. that ain't my drug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How am I going to say no to my drug when yeah. I got alcohol in me? Ain't Absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah, bro. Insanity. You mean yeah. alcohol actually disturbs your judgment? Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, shoot. Just a tad. <laughs> just a tad? Yeah. So how long, so let's just be honest. Mm-hmm. How long did that one drink last? You drank a Corona and right. Cabo mm-hmm. on, do you remember what day? It was, uh, I think we... We left on a Sunday morning, so that was a Sunday afternoon. What year? That was so not 20, 20, January 2020, I mean, February 2020. Hmm. When did you get sober? I didn't get sober till August 2022. Hmm. Wow. I drank Gee. lasted two years. A, yep. corona, a corona that he popped the top on mm-hmm. and didn't drink, mm-hmm. but carried it around mm-hmm. for a little mm-hmm. while. And then that one sip lasted a couple yeah, of But you didn't go, I mean, there's nothing in our mind, maybe, but we typically can lie to ourselves to the point where I'm really just going to drink a couple beers. Yeah. I'm not smoking crack. Well, yeah, I'm so not I'm missing just, my flight in mm-hmm. Cabo. Yeah, well, it's like, like he said, too. It's, he relapsed before he got on the plane. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, why? Because it's born in a thought. Yes. He had right. mentally relapsed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. But, you know, it's amazing how we go in to do something and how sin keeps us at a place longer and does not ever do what it promised me it'll do. Yeah, sure. Mm. Well, part of what you're talking about, too, apart from the allergy is, you know, the big book teaches us that we have this mental illness and these thoughts are readily supplanted by the next thought. And it tells you about the guy that finds himself at the bar and then six beers in, he's banging on the bar and he's saying, well, what's the use now anyhow? I'll just start, I'll start getting sober tomorrow Mm -hmm. and tomorrow just never comes. We just have this mental blank spot in our mind that once we do make that decision and we do it and then the allergy starts making those decisions for us, it's a wrap until something outside of ourselves stops us. Yep. You know, Bill, was this run worse than any run you've ever been on? Absolutely. Bradley. It was just horrible. So when, you know, COVID happened after that. So, 
I, you know, my kids moved home, so I, I you know, for a couple months, I didn't didn't drink. Use After it. Cabo, you came After home Cabo. and no Co- drinking. Correct, nothing. correct. Mm-hmm. I mean, I felt so bad about you know missing yeah. the plane and lying and doing all. But that. But you never told nobody. No, never told anybody. No. And then the kids came home. Then you know, June, kind of when they made the lift, lifted and every, you know, they, you know, my both of my uh, oldest kids were in college, so they went back, you know, to school, and then it started with just having a couple beers on the weekend and then the 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 couple beers well oh, then i'm gonna have a couple beers and a glass of scotch and i did that for a few weeks and then like the four i would say the fourth week it uh, came a few scotches and then it just i'm like i, I needed something more i needed mm-hmm. that charge mm-hmm. and i went right down the road to the same drug dealer that i'd you, that i'd purchased from but at that point, almost 18 years later, still mm-hmm. in business. Wow. Yeah. Still in business. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. And uh, it, then it would, it, the binges were 24 hours, and then they become became 48, became 72, till at the end I was awake 16 of 21 days. Mm. How many treatment centers or rehabs did you go to in that two years? That two years. One, two, three, four. Were you mm. wanting to get sober I when was. you went? I was. Yeah. I was. I, I had it just wouldn't click. It just wouldn't click, and I was just I, I was just filled with so much shame and um, and hurt. Hurt. Yeah. Mm. I was just so there was so much. It was like a dual thing going on there because yeah. I had this grief that I never really processed mm-hmm. and dealt with, and and then which led to the addiction. So then I had these two elephants in the room. So you know when I finally found a place that could treat me for both you know like i used to tell people that i'm crazy i have two shrinks so i did i had my one from grief and then i had my addiction counselor mm-hmm. and, we, and they worked together to help to help mm. you know how long of a stay were these rehabs well the three of them were like 28 30 day deals the last one was 90 days and that that's because that man right there he's like bill if you're gonna do it 90 or, 90 or nothing, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, because I, and I'm so yeah. thankful for that. 30 would have never. And that's never that's the point done. I was trying to get across mm-hmm. is, you know, we don't even land until day 30. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm in Florence. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. I, I've been here for 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> How'd I get here? Yes. I remember coming to at the bowling alley. Yeah. You know, at the Owl's Nest, they'd take you to yeah. the bowling yeah. alley on the weekends. And, like, that's my first memory of being in the bowling alley. It's like, whoa. I remember uh, we, that first Bill went to Waypoint, and I'd heard great things. I told his sisters about them. But he ended up going to Myrtle Beach, uh, some guys I've known for years. And one day I get this call from Chris Hawker. Uh, your buddy <laughs> ain't been home. <laughs> we can't find him. And I said, you're not going to find him. Yeah, He's going to surface when he's ready. Yeah. Um, but I want to say your sobriety date is latter summer. Hey, August 1st, 2022. So mm. Mm. I was in Destin, South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina. Lord, please. <laughs> let me. I was in Destin, Florida. Got a call from Bill, but they had done an intervention on you. Mm-hmm. This was, you said August 1st? Yeah, August 1st. It was probably late July. So there was it was the there, latter part of July. July. Correct. And I remember talking to you. <laughs> you don't remember yeah, talking barely, to me. Barely, no, no, you don't. <laughs> barely. <laughs> but um, what, uh, what was the turning point then? Because you made a decision in that course of a few weeks that I'm leaving South Carolina and I'm committing to 90 days of treatment. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's a, gives me goosebumps talking about it. So at that point, my sisters, and they, you know, my, my oldest sister, Phyllis, her son is in recovery. He just celebrated three years. Hey, awesome. Uh, so she's very involved with that. That's Al-Anon. awesome. So mm. she's, she's really involved with Al-Anon. She met uh, a a lady there that that recommended the bridge center i mean bridge center, excuse me recommended the orchard for me to go to which is in is in texas. texas houston texas called the orchard on the brazos mm-hmm. that's awesome um and then at that point you know i bs my somehow bs that i got to get some rest so they wouldn't let me stay at my house or so went over to the blackley inn and, and slept for two days basically and uh you know did they, they didn't have my car you know, but then day two, then I just walked down and went to Jay Peters and had a beer, mm-hmm. you know, and had some dinner. And then um, 
just I wasn't done. I had I had to go on one more little run. Yeah. And uh that one was a was about a five day or of and, and at the third day and I was so tired I'd never healed from the first this I mean, these were bent. The, the talking, just became closer. When you say healed, you mean body, body physically. Physically, my, I mean, just a wreck, emaciated, skinny. Not, I mean, I would go the way you know I would use, and I mean, I would drink and then start smoking crack. Then I quit drinking, drink Gatorade and smoke crack. But not two days, not three days. I'm talking four, five, six days. Mm, I no sleep, mm -hmm. no sleep at all, no food, just Gatorade and crack. Mm -hmm. And when I when I picked up on this last go round, it like after the third day, I mean, and the the paranoia and the hallucinations were were getting worse. I mean, I ripped holes in my walls in my house. I my house was destroyed. Mm. You know, I'm pulling pictures. There's a message for me. You know, from mm -hmm. whoever they are. Yeah. But like the third day, I remember um, I was in my house. At this point, everybody was like, Ch -ch -ch, "You got to figure it out." You know, you figure it out. You call us when you're ready for help. Kids, my son's gone. Everybody, you know, there's no one. Yeah. Uh, and I remember just yelling out to God in my house at the top of my lungs, Lord, please help me. I can't stop. Mm. Please help me. I can't mm. stop. And I'm driving down the road with tears running down my face, going to the dealer to score again. Please help me. I can't. Mm -hmm. And this went on for about 24 hours. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was uh, July 29th. Yep, July 29th. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, I, you know, I'd be, again been up this however many more days at this point, and it, something happened. Miracle, I mean, Holy Spirit got involved. Mm. It just a miracle happened. Yeah, I, I put the, I put it down. That at this point, Jane was calling me a very sweet lady at the orchard. Said, "I'm just going to check in with you every day, you know, because I had talked to her when I talked to Bradley." She, I was like, I don't know where I am yet. She's like, you know, she was really cool. I'm just going to check in with you. And I picked up the phone and said, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, at, at that point, I called my other sister. She said, I said, I'm ready. She said, well, give me your credit card information. I'll book you a flight. And I stopped, mm -hmm. put the pipe down. I got my act together for 24 hours to to try to get packed because I knew I was going for, for a long time. Uh and of course, I drank on the plane on the way over there, and you know, came in soused. No uh, doubt. And that, you know, I got in. That was on the thirty first, and then I woke up on the morning, you know, sober of August first, which mm. is my sobriety date there. And again, Cliff, you're so spot on. I mean, really, I, I don't really remember the first couple week, two, three weeks at Tree. I really don't. I mean, I was that. I slept, I think, for for maybe twenty four hours straight. Mm. Yeah. That that for mm -hmm. it was you know it was I was in bad shape man, yeah. um, but but I knew after about two three weeks man I'm like, you know I'm I'm gonna this I'm giving everything I have for this yeah. everything yeah and I did I went all in I mean I was the guy I was the class, I was the first guy there I'm the guy participating I'm asking questions I'm I'm being open with my shrinks I'm I mean like. Fix me, man. I need help. Yeah. You know? And, you know, it's so it's so good to hear you say that because, you know, two to three weeks in is where you really start getting it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the first two weeks, you don't really remember your landing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we make the That's decision. That's why they call that blackout. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We make the decision before didn't we go know that, to rehab huh. of how long we're going to stay. Yeah. But we're not in our right mind when we make that decision. You know, hmm. so we have to let other people's thinking guide us, you know, and so that's the reason I want him, you know, expressing this to the people who are listening is that you learn from the mistakes of others if you're wise. Mm -hmm. And he has experienced that 30 day didn't work, 30 day didn't work, 30 mm -hmm. day didn't work. So when you're calling to go somewhere and they have multiple options or you have multiple options, 30 days, 90 days, learn from this man's mistakes. Yeah. Mm. You can do one 90 day program and get more than if you do several 30-day programs. Mm. So, yeah, that's mm. good. You know, and I'll tell you which was really cool. I'll never forget. It was probably about day 30, and I was out getting some exercise early one morning, and Dan, who who's, owns the orchard, he went to 11 rehabs. We have a very similar story. Mm. Struggled to get sober. And I remember he was sitting out having a cup of coffee, and I stopped, and we started talking to him. I said, Dan, how did you know that, like, 
you were done, like really done. And, and he said something to me that was just so spot on. And it was where I was at that place. He said, when I was willing to do whatever they suggested. Mm, that's so good. And that was it. And I was, that's where I was. Yeah. Y'all tell me if I need, I mean, literally my mindset was if y'all want me to stay a year, yeah. I will stay yeah. a year. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a good like, place yeah. to be. Yeah. It's, it's, that's yeah. the sweet spot. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, he paid a high price yeah. for, sure. for yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember being in the Owl's Nest and, you know, it was about two weeks in, somewhere around in there. And there you would start on the front row and then you'd work your way back however long you've been there. And I remember I was sitting in a meeting and I, I couldn't tell you who was teaching. But I remember I had this thought and I, it was, maybe these people know what they're talking about. Maybe I don't know as much as I think I do. Mm. Maybe I should do everything they tell me to do and see if this works. Mm. And I made that decision right there. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, mm. I'm going to go get high. Yeah. Yep. And I just did everything they said. Yep. Boom. 12 mm-hmm. years later, it's still working. <laughs> it's funny yeah. you say that because I vividly yeah. remember mm. leaving the detox in Williamson at Wellspring. And I remember making my mind up before I went, I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. Mm. So, Look, mm. there's a common denominator going on mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. You got to get to that point. Yep. Mm-hmm. If you're going to stay sober. Yep. Well, that's coming sober, to yourself. Yeah. I, I'm not saying God ain't involved in that, but it's this ability that God gives us to look in the mirror and say, I'm done fighting anything mm-hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm. Help me. Yes. And I don't like it's so crazy how you said you get help because you want it and willing to make the effort. Here's what's equally as bad as not wanting it, wanting it your way. Yeah. Mm. 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 yeah. And I realized mm-hmm. that when I wanted the help and I didn't care the help you gave me, mm-hmm. I knew yep. that I could potentially overcome whatever it was because yeah. for the first time in my life, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me yep. to do. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Mm. So these last 19 months, Bill, tell us about it. Mm-hmm. Gosh, man, it is, you know, honestly, it, it's, it's, the biggest accomplishment in my entire life, mm. you know, because as we know, the historically in, in recovery, I mean, someone with a long term sobriety relapse is typically a bullet, mm. you know, it and, is, you know, and I, I'm just so thankful for God's grace mm-hmm. uh, for really a second. I mean, I really feel like I've been just given this second opportunity of mm. life, yeah. and I'm going to use it to the fullest. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it to help others, to share my, you know, Courage, strength, and hope with others. Yeah. yeah. To and you know, I'm very public about my my recovery and my addiction because I, I want to to help others. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I, I just it's my what, what's so crazy. It's just like the big book talks is God. He you know I feel like Job in a way because not only did he, he he's given me back, he's given me so much more yeah. because I, my relationship with my children through that and our family counseling and the work we did. We're closer now with me and my three children than we've ever been. Mm, awesome. I mean, I taught, you know, I have one, my oldest son's in tech, I mean, in California, my daughter's in Columbia in graduate school, and then I have a 10th grader at home, and I mean, you know, that he's my bud, you know, we yeah. hang, and, um, but it's just, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. I, you know, earn the, the trust in the business community back, and my, you know, integrity there, and my team that, that, that in my business were, you know, we have that family. They trust me again. They know mm, yeah. if I'm late, it's just Bill's late, not Bill's on a bender. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they, it, it, it's just really a beautiful time. I mean, it's just, church is even so much more special, you know. Just, uh, you know, my, my quiet time, like this morning, you know, I, I, I always take, you know, upon awakening, page 86, I, I, I uh, have turned that into my kind of my own little prayer that I pray each mm-hmm. morning. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, we use that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, we yeah. Do too. That's, mm-hmm. that's my prayer sure. too. Yeah. I turn that into a prayer, which mm-hmm. is the way I was taught to do yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not something you read, mm-hmm. it's yeah. the way that you have a personal relationship with yeah. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, I think there's something to be said about when Jesus is involved. Mm. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I, I don't want to preach right now, but I'm mm-hmm. just saying that when I think about his story, you better be careful who you count out and mm-hmm. who you take their low mm-hmm. spots as a time for you to make it your, uh, what, what do I, what is it that we usually make, say? somebody else's downfall, your entertainment. Yeah, mm-hmm. you better be careful because God even has a purpose in the pain. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. for sure. And it's clear, because um, here's the truth, man. Like, I don't 
it rattles my cage to ever sense that I would potentially have to go through what he went through. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's the first thing I thought of when I heard, because I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't know your story. You know, you give me a 12 year chip and I'm thinking how great this is. And then I hear 15. I'm yeah. like, whoa. Yeah. Mm. Well, Immediate. I'm just saying, yeah. mm. like, check. Mm. I'm yeah. not arrogant. That's, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I'm asking questions yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, I want to know yep. what his path was so that I can mm -hmm. traverse that yep. and, and do it in a way that I don't stumble because mm -hmm. I want to learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, and yeah. I wish I would have had someone ahead of me on that. Yeah. You know, so I, I would have. Because, you know. I mean, dude, we don't know what we would do. No. Mm -mm. I'm just no. telling you right now. No clue. Mm -hmm. How arrogant of me to say I wouldn't do that. Mm. I have no idea because no, I live in a traditional family too. My wife pays the bills. Things may be in my name, but she has a strength I don't. Mm -hmm. Something was to happen to her, it would turn my world mm -hmm. upside down. Yeah. No doubt. Mm -hmm. And so I love to hear these stories of God's provision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fact that God didn't always cause it, but he had a plan prior to that in it when we surrender, he works the mess back out to yep, the message. No. Yep. He painted way before the foundation of mm -hmm. the world. And Bill, as we conclude this, I don't know if you remember me saying this. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. not, but I gave you a verse one day and you mm -hmm. just mentioned feeling like Job. And I think you had said this to me one day when we were playing golf. And I said, I think Job 42, 12 is your scripture. And this is what the first part of it says. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really want to just prophesy that over your yes. life, that I truly believe that your best days are ahead yes. and that I do believe it was good that you were afflicted mm -hmm. because I think that the far weight of glory that affliction is going to produce, you have not begun to see the beginning of what God is about to do mm. with mm. that pain. Yeah, yeah man. Mm. I really, I really feel that. Amen. To Thank that. you. You know, what was so crazy, like you were talking about the owl's nest. I mean, like things that I never thought they reached out to me. I'm going to go speak there, share my story mm -hmm. in May 3rd. Nice. Yeah. You know, I mean, never a million years. <laughs> yeah. I think Bro, I'd be we doing might that, need to go know? down yeah. May 3rd. Yeah. Yeah. Come it's on. been a while yeah. since yeah. we've been I there. I've been there in a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing, Bill. And hey, man. The story was is meant to be told. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I truly believe because of your vulnerability this time around to be able to expose and to be vulnerable and to expose, eventually that thing can't have power nope. over you. No, mm -hmm. no, nope. sure. absolutely. Especially when you use it to yep. bring uh you know hope to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Man, and it, it loses power. power. Yeah, then it becomes mm -hmm. power yep. for you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, Bill, thank you mm -hmm. for coming. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you thank for having you. me, guys. Thank you for the pleasure. Man, mm. that just blessed my heart. Yeah, it did. I mean, I held back some tears. Yeah, mm. I did. Oh, me too. <laughs> he smoked me a couple times. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It. I don't ever, and I mean, I'm holding it back now. I, I don't ever want these stories to become familiar. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Because we're sitting across from a miracle. Mm. Yeah. 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 No it's doubt. Like, he yeah. should be dead. Mm. Yep. Yep. Like, I don't know. Man. Or Thank out here you. strung out doing the yeah. same thing mm -hmm. at the same yep. dope yep. hole. Yep. Yeah, man, I'm just thankful when people count us out. God calculated that in. Yep. And mm -hmm. I just love the fact that God goes after those yep. like us yeah. in these situations. Like, this mm -hmm. is his character. This yep. is his nature. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bro, I said yep. all the time, if God picked a basketball team, it would not be the way we do. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if I go yeah, out like there... I'm like, man, let me get first pick. Yeah. You know yeah. why? Because I'm going to pick CJ. Because yeah. he about the block. I mean, he's the best shooter on the court. Yeah. God ain't do that. Yeah. He said, I'm going to pick Cliff. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. He, yeah. He goes well, who's <laughs> Cliff? He's uh, at a bid down here in Columbia <laughs> County in the prison. Yeah, who's right. CJ? Yeah. yeah, he's snorting fit and all yeah. got sores. He can't heal. What you mean? Yeah. Well, Don't look at him. He picks fishermen and their yeah. nets are empty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He, rolls up on he, he picks the junkers, can't even catch no fish. fish. <laughs> they, all he does, throw your net over there. Yeah. They're, they're right in the vicinity yeah. and can't get the fish. Yeah. But you know, man, when he takes that man, and yes. he reestates, restores, puts a foundation, and sends them out with a new song. Mm -hmm. People know mm -hmm. that we ain't that good. Yeah, I yep. did that. God did that. Mm -hmm. And guess what? His name becomes famous. Yep. That's right. Because I did that. Yep. I love the fact that we can't boast, but God say, 
I did that. Yep. Yep. Remember when they tried to catch him up when they were saying, well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is my daddy. Mm -hmm. You know, because back then you were really referenced by who your daddy was. And Jesus said, well, I'm Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's daddy. (laughs) (laughs) And then he says, no, your father is... The, the devil. father of lies. Yep. Yeah. 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 But yeah. imagine Jesus coming up and they trying to get him, like yep. my daddy Abraham, and mm-hmm. he just looks at him and says, well, I'm their daddy. I'm their daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and just drops the mic, just, bro. Yeah. Well, man, wow. That's powerful, man. It is powerful. That's and powerful. I just, man, I can't wait for the listeners to hear this. But, uh, Bill, you got, you, uh, you got a chance to win something. Yep. Awesome. You do. Now, yeah. if you shoot anyway, like you shot before this. I'm in, I'm in real trouble. You got a, you got about a yeah. 1% chance to take home something. Yeah. So I'm going to need you to push this mic okay. back, okay? okay? Get yourself situated. Put your coffee down. And I and I want you to make one of these shots. Oh, I got to focus like it's uh, 1999. A putt to be yes. Oh, All right. That was your practice. I mean, okay. yeah, yeah that's your go. practice. You yeah. got three shots now. Three shots. Oh, that was close. Oh, third time's the charm. Third time. It's got Dude. one more, oh, Bill. No. All right, I got to really focus here. Don't. Stay you're up. playing like Clemson did last night. I am. Bang! Yeah. Sitting down shooting. Bottom. <laughs> Sitting down shooting is yeah. hard. Yeah, hard. well, don't tell him you stood up <laughs> because we didn't let nobody else stand up. <laughs> Well, guys, Bill Nickus, the one and only. We love you, Bill. Yeah, yeah. love um, you too, guys. I hope it's okay for me to say, if you're in Anderson, if you're in Greenville, the southeast area, go to Sullivan's Metropolitan Grill down uh, town. The best food mm-hmm. uh, you can Fire. have, mm-hmm. and support your local businesses. Um, again, we love you. Thank you for love coming. You Until love next you, Bill, time, man. love you, CJ. Peace. Thank you. Love, love you, bro. Yeah, I love you, man. Thank you. Guys.